Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. We are located on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and are interested in hearing of any encounters or sightings from here on the island. If you've had an encounter or sighting, please give us a call or text us your experience at 778-227-7588. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. So we okay. have a great guest tonight, uh, Leah Seltzer from British Columbia. Uh, he's going to be with us in a few minutes, and uh, he has uh, had a lot of experience in British Columbia and a lot of encounters, and and uh, I guess we should bring him on. Is he... Is he uh, yes, I've got him on right now. Let me bring him on. Okay, great. Well, why don't, why don't I introduce him to everybody, and unless you have something to say. No, go right ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. Leo was uh, born and raised as a farm boy, spent most of his childhood up to the age of 17 on a small farm in Langley, British Columbia, Canada. From the time he was seven or eight years old, he had an interest in Sasquatch, known then as the abominable snowman. In 1957, at the age of 10, he and his sister were picking huckleberries on their farm when he came upon some human-looking footprints in the mud. From that point on, he read everything he could find about Sasquatch. In 1972, he moved to Prince George's, uh, British Columbia, which is about 500 miles north of uh, the Canadian-USA border. He lives only minutes from the prime, from prime hunting wilderness areas and has, since 1904, been a very dedicated and successful big game hunter and woodsman. Leo had his first Sasquatch sighting, in 1984 while while out hunting. The following year, he had another clear sighting only from only about 200 yards away. Over the years, over the years he has had other sightings and several close encounters. He came he became seriously interested in Sasquatch research when the internet began uh, to get inundated with information about Sasquatch somewhere around the year 2000. It was in 2004 that he got actively involved in Sasquatch research. The turning point in his life was made that made him dedicated to Sasquatch research work was the hunting season. His wife had shot a small moose at close range, and before they could circle the bush to get it, it had disappeared. The blood trail vanished, and so did further tracks. It simply vanished from where it stood. After he and his wife and my brother put out and his brother put out about 16 man-hours searching for it. Um, all they found were large impressions in the ground and in the dry grass. And the only conclusion that can, that the only conclusion um, that continually became evident for the next for the moose disappearing was a Sasquatch had taken it. The next day, fresh Sasquatch evidence was all around the area. Uh, I'd like to hear more about that. Leo wrote a book in 2007 called A Walk in the Woods, Sasquatch Lives Here. It's available on DVD only. And uh, to have the, um, if you want to get this book, you have to go to his website, which is um, www.sasquatch-pg.net, and uh, his website, and you can order it for 19.95. Uh, and it will be shipped free anywhere in North America. I'd like to welcome Leo Seltzer to Bigfoot Tonight Show. How are you doing, sir? Thank you very much, Chuck. Oh, I'm doing all right. By the way, uh, you're coming in crystal clear, but uh, your partner there seems to be coming in pretty broken up. So, is, I just is it any better? On you. Is it any better right now? I just noticed they yes. started clearing up about two minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. it's so, starting to sound better. Yeah. Good. Anyway, thank you very much, Chuck. It's a real pleasure to be on your program. I'd sure like to thank your listeners for taking this time out of their busy lives to be with us. Well, and thank you for coming on. We appreciate you uh, being our first guest on the new Bigfoot Tonight <laughs> Show. We really appreciate <laughs> we it. We really do. Thanks a lot. We really do. And, yeah, I'm so glad everything cleared up just as you came on. That's terrific. <laughs> Blog talk must have heard our call, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I guess somebody must have. Yeah. Well, you know, uh why don't we why don't we start off at the beginning where you started off in with your um in your bio. When you and your sister were 
found that print? Was it a big print? Was it a little print? How did you? Why did you think it was a Sasquatch? Well, there wasn't um, a whole lot of people wandering around the bush where I lived. Uh, it was out in farming country, and uh, people out in that farming country sort of stayed on their own land. Mm-hmm. But there was a huge puddle at the back of our uh, of our of our of our pasture land, and um, we came across that that puddle because we were picking uh, huckleberries along the along the bush line, and this was right at the edge of the bush line. Now these footprints look like human footprints. I wonder who in the world would be back here messing around on our property. And even as a child, I knew there was something different about these footprints. They looked very boxy looking. Um, if you can imagine the 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 foot of a of a child that's maybe about oh, f- three, four, five years old, their their toes are kind of boxy looking, and the foot is kind of boxy looking. It's different than a mature adult foot. And that's what I was looking at. But these these footprints were were probably in a in a in a man size boot, probably somewhere around about a five, something like that. So they they were they were bigger than a child's foot. And I'm looking at these, and I couldn't figure this out. But there was two different sizes. There was a, there was one set that was larger. Now I'm not quite sure how large they were, but they were a bit bigger. And um, it, it it was just really strange seeing them there. They just didn't look. Right, mm-hmm. and um, I had been doing some reading about Sasquatch and stuff in these magazines that I had been ordering, and it, it started ringing some bells, and that kind of got my interest uh, sparked. Right. Um, in, your 1984 sighting, your first sighting of a Sasquatch, you were out hunting then. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I uh, there's a hunting area that's not all that far from where I live. It only takes about an hour to drive there. Um, it's quite a quite a large hill, almost like a small mountain, that I drove up uh, onto the top of it. It had been logged off a few years before, and it was starting to grow up quite well. But there was a uh, there was a nice clear landing um, with a little bit of a corral, or I think somebody might have had it as a guiding territory at one time. Uh, from that landing, I could get a pretty good view of the hillside, and I could see probably uh, oh eight, nine hundred, maybe a thousand yards down towards the north end of the hill, and I could see a bit off towards the south too. Um, I arrived there, and I, I did a couple of moose calls, and and just see see what was if there was anything around the area, and just down below me and off to my left. Uh, probably no more than a couple hundred yards away, I could hear this bang, bang, bang. I thought, well, somebody chopping wood. And this repeated several times over a period of about 15 minutes or so, and I realized it didn't sound like chopping wood. It sounded like somebody actually banging on a tree with a big stick or a big club. Well, I, I, I kind of half ignored that. And I kept on uh, every every minute or couple of minutes, three, four, five minutes, whatever. I'd do another moose call. Mm-hmm. And after about, uh, oh, I guess about 20 minutes of this or something like that, off to the north at the far end of the, of the hill, there was a very huge fir tree standing there, a big giant fir tree. And from where that fir tree was, I could hear banging over that way. And then below me, I would hear bang, bang. And then up right. there by the fir tree, I'd hear bang, bang. And I'm wondering, what's going on here? So I did a couple of more moose calls over a period of maybe about five or six minutes. And and every time I'd do a moose call from up where the big fir tree was, I'd hear this banging like somebody hitting the tree with a big club. Wow. Um, the one down below me on my left, I hadn't heard that again for for a while, and I never did hear it again that day, but... Um, it seemed like every time I did this call, I'd hear this banging up by the fir tree, right. and it just wasn't making any sense. I mean, I've been I've been hunting big game for over forty years, and this this is not something you run across out in the bush. Um, after I guess probably about half an hour or so of this carrying on, I saw a figure walk out from behind the tree. I couldn't see very clearly because it was kind of a windy day, and every time I tried to look through my binoculars or through my spotting scope, it was so jiggly I could hardly make it out, but I could make out that it looked like a human figure uh, on two legs. Mm -hmm. 
And so anyway, I did another moose call, and I saw the figure bang on the tree. I went, why would some hunter be up there banging on a tree? You're going to just going to get into trouble with the other hunters in the area. <laughs> then I walked away from the tree and stood probably, um, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 feet away from the tree. I watched it for a while, and it didn't seem to be moving around. Every once in a while, I could see it just kind of shift its weight a little bit. But then between me and this figure, uh, this figure was, I'd say, probably about 900 yards away from me. Uh, between me and the figure, I saw this little black bear come walking out, and he stood there, and he kind of looked around for a while, and then he started walking up towards this figure. Uh-huh. Uh, he got probably within, I would say, 150 yards of it, stood up on his hind legs, and he looked directly at it, went down on all four legs, and he come running straight toward me. I'm wondering, why is a stupid bear running toward me? This isn't making any sense. Yeah. Uh, he was not running like a bear that was just on the move. He was deathly afraid. He was laid out like a greyhound. He was really moving. And he got... Uh, within about 300 yards of me, I guess, and then he turned and he went straight up over the top of the mountain, disappeared. Then this figure walked in behind the tree again and disappeared. But as it walked over towards the tree to disappear behind the tree, I noticed this broken off branch that was sticking out, and it was just a little bit above his head. Um, So that was pretty well it for that day. And the next day... Uh, I spent the night there, camped in that clearing, and during the night, something was wandering around my camper most of the night. I'd go out there to look, and I couldn't see it. Nothing to be seen. As soon as I closed the camper door and go back inside, I could hear something moving around. Now, the, this clearing had a lot of dry grass in it, and some of the dry grass was as high as your knees, so it's not hard to pick up something moving around your camp. Right. I opened up the windows on my camper, just so I could hear better, shut the lights off inside. The odd time I could catch what almost looked like a shadow moving, but one of those things you're not sure whether you're really seeing something or not. But it moved around my camper um, most of the night like that. A couple of times I woke up and I could hear it moving around, and I'd turn on the flashlight, look out the window, and I couldn't see anything. Uh, So anyway, the next morning, I looked around my camp, and uh, I could see large impressions in the grass where the grass had been pressed down, but the ground was very hard. I couldn't see any tracks. All I could see was uh, pressed down grass. I had some breakfast, and I went up to where that big fir tree was to have a look around. I noticed that big branch sticking out, and I walked over to that big branch, and I had a look at it. And the figure that was over by the tree the night before had to have been somewhere around about eight to nine feet tall. Hmm. So I got to thinking, you know, I don't know of any hunt any, any people that are that tall. Um, I started thinking I must have seen a Sasquatch, but at that point in time I wasn't really too sure about the Sasquatch stuff. I believed in them, and I'd been reading a lot about them throughout my my life, but, uh, you know, when you see one, you start really questioning yourself. Right. Well, anyway, I had to look around a little bit further, and I went in the direction where I thought it had disappeared over the uh, edge of the hill in the bush, and I found some huge impressions in the ground. They looked like they could have been footprints. They weren't clear, but they were very large, probably about 18 inches long, and about the width Width-wise, they were probably about twice the width of my foot, my feet. So I really got a little bit curious about this and looked around. I couldn't find anything else around. Um, later on that day, I went down to the bottom of the mountain where some hunters were camped. They were from uh, from the lower mainland, and they had a, a small moose hanging up. So I talked to the guys a little bit. I asked him, did you happen to have anybody poking around here or an animal poking around here last night or anything? And the one fellow says, yeah. He says, I got up about 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 in the morning, something like that for a pee. And he said, uh, I thought I saw somebody walking around over by our moose. So I grabbed the flashlight and I walked out of our camper. They had a big tow around, fifth wheel camper. And he says, I walked out of the camper and I had a look around and, and I couldn't see anything or anybody, but... I'm sure that big shadow I saw almost looked like a man, but it was huge. 
and it had walked around the moose that was hanging there, and it had apparently pulled on the uh, on the uh, the cloth that they had the meat wrapped in, but it never touched, never bothered with it. It just left. Wow. So that was a very interesting first experience. My God, yeah. And when when you were looking across this field, like nine hundred yards, how? I mean, did did you have binoculars or anything, or was that? Oh, yeah, I had a pair of 10, 10 power by 50 binoculars, and I also had a spotting scope that was 25 to 42 power, but the spotting scope was just a little too shaky sitting on a cram- camera stand with the wind blowing, but it did stop blowing there for about 30 seconds, and I ran over and I got a good look through the spotting scope, and what I looked at, uh, I got maybe about a five seconds of good clear view of it, and then the wind picked up again, and it it looked like a man standing there. Okay. Uh, that's all I can say. I couldn't see any features or anything, but uh, you know, I had to have the spotting scope cranked down to, to 25 power in order to be able to see clearly because of the shaking. But uh, right. what I saw looked like a big man standing there, and that's all I can say. And then the next day, when I realized that guy had to be eight to nine feet tall, it it certainly uh, perked my interest. Yeah, and was it all one color? Yeah, the, the it was man. kind of a, a, a dark brown color. Um, it was just about the same color as the bark on the fir tree, uh, very dark uh, brown, um, some darker streaks in it, I guess, patches, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And after this sighting, uh, had you had any, uh, how long was it before you had another encounter? I guess it was the following year, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, and it was in the same area. Not very uh-huh. far away from there. And can you tell us about that one? Yeah, there was a um, on uh, along the main road. The main road sort of took a little bit of a curve off towards the left. It was a slow bend in the road. And just when you're coming into that bend in the road, there's a there's a small road that branched off to the right, and it went up the side of this mountain. And there was, the area around that intersection was quite well logged off. There was probably 50 acres or so that had been logged off. So there was nothing in the way to obstruct your vision. I drove up that little road off to the left and hunted up on the mountain for a while, and I came back down. And I'm about 200 yards, I guess, from the main road. And I stopped there for a little bit. I was riding a three-wheeler, ATC. So I stopped there and I had a little sip of coffee and then I'm looking around and just seeing if there's anything around the area. And I saw this fella come walking down the road. Now, I'm up above so I can't really tell how tall this guy is, but being 200 yards away from the road, you sort of start getting a bit of an idea. But he walked along the road. He came from my left and he walked around the bend in the road and he walked past my location and, and up the road a little further. As he's walking by, uh, I originally saw him about 250 yards or so away, and the closest point he got to me was about 200 yards, and then he started, as the road sloped, uh, he got slightly further away. I noticed that this fellow was not carrying any firearm, and now this is the third week of October, and uh, the weather's starting to get kind of cool. It was one of those days where it's so dark, you don't know if it's going to snow or what it's going to do. And in the middle of the afternoon, you almost think you have to turn your headlights on. So it's a very dull, dingy day. But I could see clearly enough to see that the palm of his hands were very light colored. And the entire figure was a very dark color, uh, looked brown. Now, that time of year, it's not unusual to see hunters out in the bush dressed in camo. And so nothing other than that really dawned on me. But I realized this fellow was not carrying a firearm, and I thought, well, maybe he's having some problems or something. I'll go down and talk to the guy, see if maybe he needs help. Maybe his truck broke down or whatever. You never really know. So I started up the engine on my three-wheeler and revved it up, and I popped it in gear. And as he's walking, he's already past me, and he turned his whole upper body, I'm I'm saying he generically, because I don't know if it's a he or a she, but I presume it was a he. I didn't see any breasts or anything. But anyway, the whole upper body turned and looked at me, and he took about two more steps and then made an immediate 90-degree left, disappeared into the bush. This is weird. I I, I thought, this is really weird. There's got to be something wrong here. I better go find out what's going on with that guy. 
So I drove down below, and I I, I, uh, I went to where I thought he had gone into the bush. Oh, probably 50 or 60 yards in the bush, I could hear footsteps walking away. So I hollered out a couple of times, hey, you, you know, is there anything I can do for you? Do you need any help? Is everything okay? You know, I'm trying to get his attention and get a response back. Um, I thought I heard a, a kind of like a grunt or mumble or something once, but I... I wasn't really totally sure if I did hear anything or not, but the steps kept on going until I couldn't hear any more sticks cracking or anything. It was out of, out of my earshot. So I got to thinking, you know, this really is not right. There's got to be something wrong. I've got to try and track that fella down. So I walked up and down the ditch and looking for his footprints, and sure enough, I found the footprints were exactly where he had walked in. But what I found wasn't what I was expecting. I found footprints that were probably 17, 18 inches long, and it looked like somebody walking in their bare feet. Right. But the footprints were more boxy-looking than a normal human foot. Well, I realized that this was... I had seen a Sasquatch the year before, and I realized I just saw him again. Don't know if it was the same one. But I wasn't really too willing to say that to the fellow that I was hunting with. He was off hunting in a different direction, so I, I, I said, well, enough of this. I, I headed back over towards we had le- where we had left the truck. He got back about the same time as I did, and I, he said, you look at, got a funny look on your face. What happened? Oh, I said, uh, I saw this guy walking down the road. And I said, he was, off, he was awfully big. I, he was probably taller than half the road is wide and paul looks at me he says you got to be kidding i said no i said that dude had to be eight nine feet tall and where he walked in the bush he was walking in his bare feet i said what do you think of that (laughs) paul looked at me he says well i don't know what you've been smoking but you better give me some of that stuff (laughs) (laughs) so anyway he didn't really have much interest in pursuing the conversation any further about that but um right. yeah that really burned in my memory uh quite strongly and i've i've thought about that many times over the years now at any point uh, and uh, back then what year was this one by the this was 85 85 yeah yeah it had, had, had you had you thought about maybe this was something you'd like to look into more like maybe go out and actually look for them instead of hunting or this that hadn't crossed your mind yet or what um actually it hadn't really crossed my mind because i was still trying to sort this out for my in my own mind myself i knew what i had seen there was no doubt in my mind what i had seen there was no doubt in my mind that i had seen a sasquatch but you know it's a little hard to digest uh when it happens like that i mean i'd had an interest in them all my life but uh all of a sudden, there you are. You're, you're, you're looking at one. You're watching them. And uh, you know, back in those days, if if you told somebody you'd seen a Sasquatch, they'd laugh at you. They'd laugh. They laugh you out of town. It's not like well, today where you can do. actually talk about it fairly openly. You know. Yeah. Well, the internet has done a tremendous amount of 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 opening up a lot of avenues of things that people didn't used to be able to talk about, and Sasquatch is one of them. That's uh, true. Now, yeah. That's very true. Well, tell me when when did you get a close up look at one? How how close did you ever get to to where you knew exactly what you were looking at and there was no no, you know, no doubt. Uh, I guess that would probably have been I believe that it was 1994. I was off hunting with uh with my brother. We were in north west of Prince George, a couple hours drive. Uh, there was a, uh, a clearing. Um, I I would say it was probably... I'm just guessing at this because it's, it's, it's probably 150 acres clearing. Right. And it was starting to get grown up fairly well. Um, there, it was on a little bit of a slope. And... Uh, the road ran right smack through the middle of it, basically, and it was a fairly straight, straight road. So it uh, it didn't wherever you were, a little bit up above, you could get a pretty good look. 
and we were out moose hunting, so it was a good place to 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 really spend some time. Uh, there was enough food, enough shelter for the moose to hang around. Yet you could get a reasonably good look around, and if you had to take a shot, you could get a good shot. Um, I I was walking up around the top end, close to the timber. Uh, my brother was off hunting, off the off in an area not far from that clearing. Uh, I heard some voices down below in the bottom, right down the bottom corner. There's a bit of a swamp down there, and uh, uh, there was some green grass around where the mud was. Now, this was this was in October, so everything is all dry and, and getting cold. Mm-hmm. But down in that corner, I could hear voices. I could hear people, sound like people talking. So I stopped and I listened for a while. And then it sounded like they were having a pretty good time because I heard Yahoo and whoop whoop, and, and they, they were making a bit of noise down there. The voices I could pick up that there was at least three individuals, maybe four, mm-hmm. uh, but just by the different different sounds of the voices. I heard some crashing sound? of branches. Pardon? Did you when when you said voices? Did you actually hear English words, or was it just like? Well, the English words I heard were "aha" uh-huh, and "whoop whoop," and I don't know if you call those English words, okay, but okay. Uh, you know the, the indications to me were that it was some people down there having a good time. Right. But then I, I walked down a little bit closer. I'm getting I, I'm starting to get kind of curious about this because there was no road or, or any trail or any campsite or anything going down into that bottom corner. I'm wondering why would people be camped down there. Or why would a group of people be down there in the first place uh, making all that noise? Just, uh, so anyway, I got a little curious, and I worked my way down. I got about halfway down there, and uh, at that time I was probably about 300 yards away from the corner of the clearing. Then I could hear them actually talking and communicating, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. Um, they were talking a language. I couldn't I couldn't hear it clear enough to make out any words. Um It sounded like it was probably not English, but then again, I couldn't really tell. Bit of a wind blowing, you know, you can't hear all uh, as clearly as you'd like to. Um, I listened to them for a little while, and then I looked back, and I saw my brother way up the top end of the clearing give me a wave. So I went back to the truck, and we left that area. We came back later on in the evening for an evening hunt. Uh, we had about two hours, I guess, before dark. I went down in towards that corner where I'd heard the voices coming from, and I sat there for a while. I did a couple of moose calls. I could hear something moving in the bush about 100 yards away from me, but I couldn't see anything. So after about a half hour of sitting there, I'm thinking, you know, if there is moose down in that corner... They must have come in after all that noise ended, so whoever was making the noise must have left. Uh, so I did a couple more moose calls, just um, very subtle moose calls, trying to entice a bull out. I heard a couple of grunts come from down in that corner, so I thought, well, you know, that's probably a moose down there. So I backed off um, a, a, a fair bit. Uh, and I moved up towards the road. Uh, I was probably about no more than 15 feet from the road, five yards or so. And there was a little clump of uh, thick little jack pines there. So I, I nestled myself in behind those little jack pines, hiding myself, and yet I could get a really good look of the area below me. I sat there for a while, and I did, a, I did several moose calls. And... Um, I could hear something moving on the other side of the road in the brush. I listened for a while, and uh, I, it, whatever it was stopped moving. So I did another couple of moose calls, and uh, I could hear something on the other side of the road that moved right down close to the road. So I did one more moose call, and then I heard moo, moo, You know, like a little five-year-old kid trying to imitate a dairy cow or something like that, or a three-year-old child. Just a real moo, moo. Well, I thought it had to be my brother teasing me because we were the only two hunters in that whole area. Right. (laughs) 
there was no other hunters to be seen anywhere. We'd been there in there already. We'd been in there for four days, and we hadn't even seen any other hunters. So I figured, oh, come on. Quit yeah. messing around. So I, I was quiet for a little while. Then I did another moose call, and then I could hear this moo, moo, and I knew it was only maybe just just inside the bush on the other side of the road, probably no more than 50 feet from me at the most. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I wasn't very um, mannerly. I spoke out in a, you know, I, I said some words I shouldn't have said, and I said, bleep, 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 Richard, will you quit messing around? Don't you know there's moose around here? I heard a really loud gasping sound, like somebody, you know, when somebody gets startled and they go, <gasps> you know, breathing in through their mouth. I heard a loud gasping sound, and then I heard crash, crash, whatever it was wasn't my brother, and it was moving away. Heading heading through, across the corner of the clearing, heading for the big timber. I stepped out from behind my little hiding spot, and I saw the top half of what looked like a hair-covered person disappearing over some logs and into the bush. Uh-huh. And as far as moving is concerned, um, I've, I've been a big game hunter since 1964, and I'd, I'd shot a lot of moose in my lifetime. And I would say that that critter could have outrun a moose. That thing was moving. Wow. Hey, How Chuck. fast do you think it was moving? Oh. Pardon? Uh, go ahead, Stace. Oh, no, no, I was just, <clears throat> I kind of was going to interject something to myself. Like, this is the thing I find fascinating about these creatures. I, my, my one thing I want to see is a squatch running full out across an open field because from what, some of the sightings I've heard, I mean, w- would you have any guess at what speed you think this thing was moving at when you saw it? Oh, I don't know. But going through that bush, I think it could have outrun a moose going, going through, or I should say brush. Going through that brush, I'm sure it could have outrun a moose flat out on the open. I, I, I wouldn't even want to venture a guess. I, but I, I, I was hoping... Go ahead, <laughs> so it was moving through brush really fast. I mean, it, it impressed you at the time. It, it certainly did. I mean, there was uh, some branches and some deadfall and stuff laying on the ground. Uh, very fairly thick willow growth. Uh, some of the willow growth was like five, six, seven feet tall, eight feet tall. Uh, mm-hmm. So it had to go through a fair bit of debris to get into that heavy timber. Um, it's not something that I could run through. That's for sure. Wow. So, Chuck, we've pretty much established that Squatch's hoax themselves. He was imitating a moose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're capable of hoaxing well, I, I, just, as, I, I, just as well as we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been told by quite a few people that I uh, I am very good at doing moose calls. And I think probably what happened was it thought that I was a moose. Um, I was. There's different types of moose calls. Um and the type of moose call I was doing at that time was a, the the kind of call that a, a cow moose would do if she's trying to entice a bull. Mm-hmm. And I got a feeling that Sasquatch probably figured I was a moose. Well, do you think and you were it was hunting? coming down and, and trying to get my attention, trying to get in close to me for a, a kill, I presume. Wow. That is amazing. I mean, that you know, that's that's pretty cool. You know, you have a Sasquatch out hunting, and you're out hunting, too, for the same thing. Yeah. Well, I, after I realized what what had happened, I got to thinking, you know, I should have kept my mouth shut and not said anything. I, we might have been able to have a face-to-face uh, in, encounter. You never know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did, 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 do you ever worry you're out there with something <clears throat> with 18-inch wide uh, feet, that the bare feet, the hairy creature? And uh, does the gun give you confidence, or I mean, did you ever think that, my God, what am I out here hunting when there's these huge creatures living out here with with me? You know, did, you did know that what? come across your mind? That is something that I've never really put a whole lot of concern into. Um, for one thing, um, I'm quite comfortable out in the bush. Mm-hmm. But for another thing, I um, I'm a very curious person. Uh, I'm a very uh, uh, when there's something around me that I'm not sure what a, what it is, I want to go find out, and I'm not afraid to go find out. 
um, what I have learned about Sasquatch over the years, I mind you, I didn't know it at the time when I had the sightings, but the presence, at, even at that time, the presence of Sasquatch did not put any fear into me. It put a lot of curiosity into me. I wanted to go see this thing. I wanted to go meet it. Uh, some people think I'm nuts, but that's okay. I don't care. <laughs> they can think whatever they want to think. It's a free country. But... Um, the fact but you weren't that, sure whether they ate people, though, at the time, right? I mean, you well, really weren't sure what they did. Actually, well, that's not true. Uh, I, I I knew that they couldn't be very dangerous because if they were, there'd be people getting attacked all the time. So I, I had no fear of, of them attacking me. Um, they're around, and if they're around and they're not attacking people, they can't be very dangerous to us. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Seltzer, this is this is something Chuck and I just we probably talk at least every other day privately, and uh, this is probably something we talk about constantly. It's probably our number one subject we talk about. So it's probably why you got a little bit of chuckle there, right, Chuck? <laughs> I'm just not sure about it, are you? Uh, well, you know, yeah, I I, uh, I ran across a story on the internet. Um. I guess it was probably uh, it, it was probably about the same time as I got directly and heavily involved in Sasquatch research about 2004. Now this story, um, when I read it, it really caught my attention. But th the other thing that really caught my attention about the conclusion of the story was the fact that the story was substantiated by a state uh, a, a police officer, a state trooper who attended the scene the next day. And he substantiated the, the evidence that was found in everything. So now I'm going to tell you the story. These people had gone out camping. It was a remote little area, little place, um, a small campsite. Two or, three people could, uh, two or three parties could camp there. They pulled in the campsite late in the day. Uh, there was the couple and their little daughter. Now, I... Right off the top of my head, I can't remember how old the daughter was. I think she was three or four. For some reason, four seems to ring a bell, but I can't say for sure. But she was about that age. Um, no, one, no one else was in the campsite. They were the only ones there. While they're busy getting their campsite ready and uh, you know getting their firewood and getting things all done up, the little girl disappeared. They didn't know where she went. Uh, about that time, some other campers had pulled in, so they told the campers, our little girl just disappeared. We don't know where she went. They, they organized a search party. They went out. They searched the forest. They couldn't find the little girl anywhere. They decided, well, it's getting dark. They better go back and get flashlights and torches, whatever they can for light, and, and carry on with the search. They got back to the campsite, and the little girl was sitting on the picnic table. They asked her where she was, what happened. You know, they wanted the story from her. She, she says, well, I wandered off in the bush and I got lost and I kept on walking and walking. And she says, I didn't know where I was going. I got afraid and I started crying. And a big, a big hairy guy came, made me feel comfortable, and he picked me up and he carried me back to the campsite and he put me on the table. And he, he signaled for me to stay here. So I did. Well, it was dark. They couldn't see much around. The next morning, um, they questioned. Well, they questioned the girl that night again. You know, big hairy guy. What? What? What did this guy look like? What kind of clothes was he wearing? And the little girl said, "Well, he wasn't wearing any clothes. He was all covered with hair." Well, the next morning, they had a look around. They found huge footprints around the campsite. It looked like the footprints came right up to the picnic table, just exactly as the little girl had said. Uh, they went out and they, they reported, they got to a telephone somewhere, they reported this to the, to the police, the state trooper came out there, had a look around, and he verified the footprints. So the story seems to be quite true. And where was this at again? I, I don't exactly recall where it was. Oh, okay. Uh, it could have been in Oregon, but I, I don't remember. It's, it's been a long time since I read the story. Right. It's a very yeah. interesting so the, story. Yeah, um, that story has really stuck with me over the years. Um, basically, well, it was a little girl. I mean, good grief, if yeah. these creatures were harmful to us, 
why would they have brought that little girl back? Yeah. And I do well, have a couple I, questions on that after the break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you about that after the break. Yeah, we got to take a, a, a like a how long stays like eight ten minute break six yeah eight, something ten. like that. You need to take a little break and maybe go grab a beer or drink whatever they do during yeah. that course of time and I'll uh, I'll put you on mute Mr. Seltzer and uh, bring you back on after a couple songs. Very good. Okay. Yeah, just take a break and we'll be back with you in a few minutes. Thank okay. you. All right. See you in a minute. Okay, Doug. Okay, everybody back from the break. Chuck, you there? I'm here. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Bigfoot Tonight Show. Chuck and Stacy are on here with Mr. Yeah, <laughs> I had to pick one for you and one for me. I like CCR too, but I had to pick both. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Good, good pick. I like this one. We have Mr. Leo Seltzer on. Let me bring him back on here. Are you there, yeah. Mr. Seltzer? I am here. Thank you. Okay. I did, uh, uh, Chuck, and I uh, I did have a quick question. I actually had two ahead, questions buddy. for him, but one from the chat room, and one I was curious myself because we got ended up with that really cool story about the, you know, the uh, with the little girl. Right. Uh, you know, I, a lot of the accounts, I'm only two years into this. Uh, I had my first Bigfoot sighting March of 2009, so I'm coming up on two years here real close. And, um, you know, I didn't know, nor did I believe in these creatures whatsoever and i don't mean anybody that hears me say creature i believe i'm a creature and everybody else i some people have a little hard time using that word i don't mean anything derogatory or bad when i use that but uh <laughs> i always have to put that little disclaimer there uh, you know i've heard a lot of these just in some other books uh i can't recall which ones they were right offhand i've heard these accounts especially some of the pacific northwest indians uh the native americans talking about uh you know stories about where you know you know the the uh, Harry Man of the Forest or uh, whatever other terms they use is going to come and get you if you don't behave yourself, that kind of thing. Do you think there's any, uh, you know, any uh, anything to back up a lot of these stories, or do you think it's something that they told them to, to keep children in line like a lot of parents do with children to begin with? Well, I, I think it's probably a combination of both. Uh, there's, the, the more we learn about Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whichever you choose to call them, the more we learn about them, the more we're beginning to realize that uh, a lot of what the Native Indian people have to say about them is true. Um, I don't doubt for a moment that uh, they would take advantage of the opportunity to use that to keep their children in line. And maybe that's where some of the horrible stories about, oh my goodness, the Sasquatches are people eaters, so you better stay in here and, and not leave your tent or don't get too far away from camp kind of a thing. But... Um, you know, these things work. The boogeyman works for kids. Yeah. Why not? You know. Yeah. Adults do take advantage of opportunities to put a little fear into their children to help keep them in line. That's just the way people are. But the more we learn about Sasquatch, um, the more we're beginning to realize um, that the Native North American Indian people are are are, are very. Uh, there's a lot of truth in what they have to say about the Sasquatch. I've, I've done a lot of research on the Internet about what Native people have to say about them. I've gone out and I've personally spoken with a number of Native Indian people myself. I prefer to speak with the older people, the, the senior citizens. Um, they're the ones that seem to be uh, more willing to pass on information. The younger people, they don't seem to be too interested. or If they are, they don't show it. But I, um, I also had the opportunity, uh, of a very privileged opportunity, to be invited to a local Indian reserve. It's about a hundred and some odd kilometers from Prince George here. They phoned me up in September of 2009 and asked me if I would come out there and do a little bit of investigation because they've had Sasquatches hanging around their reserve land out there for as long as the, uh, the the community has been there, and that goes back in the 1930s, 1940s. But uh, they, they've been having a lot of problems out there uh, within the last uh, three or four years. They just wanted to, me to come out there and have a talk with them and have a look around, so I did. There's an elderly lady out there that I met, a beautiful elderly lady. She's probably in her 80s, I would think. Uh, her and I had a very interesting conversation I learned a lot from her, but uh, the position that the Native Indian people seem to take 
is that Sasquatch is a people. Not an animal, not a wild ape, but a people. And they're often they often refer to them as a people. Now, if you, if you understand the way Native Indian people communicate, to make such a statement means that they are drawing a direct connection between Sasquatch and modern man. There was a uh, uh, an Indian fellow who uh, was interviewed by um, uh, what was his name? I think his name was Peter Byrne. He worked a lot with the Native Indian people um, in the Harrison Lake area, which is uh, inland from Vancouver, British Columbia. It's in the southern Chilcot, and if you're familiar with that area at all, uh, Harrison Lake area is probably uh, a couple-hour drive north of the uh, Canada-U.S. border. But the Harrison Lake area is well-known for Sasquatch activity. As a matter of fact, Sasquatch activity is, uh, is, is widely advertised in that area as a tourist attraction. Now, going back to the, uh, to the, to the native Indian fellow, he lived at the north end of the lake uh, where there is a, a reserve, there, or there was a reserve there at that time. We're going back a number of years now. Uh, he apparently had gone out hunting, and uh, he saw what he thought was a bear crawling around a log, and a, he sent his dog in after this, what he thought was a bear in this big hollow log. What came shooting out of the log, he fired and shot and he hit it, and it turned out to be a, 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 a Sasquatch youth. Um, he just mildly wounded it, however, and he, when he shot and he realized what he had shot, he, uh, he didn't shoot again. This thing was apparently crying and making quite a fuss. I mean, you would too if you got wounded by a rifle. Anyway, he heard uh, some noise uh, uh, answering the youth, and uh, I'm not exactly sh sure exactly of, of all the particulars, but as the story goes, a female Sasquatch showed up, presumably the mother of the youth, and um, she reprimanded Charlie very sternly. Uh, he told her that it was an accident, and she reprimanded him, and she spoke in his native Indian language. Whether the story is true or not, I don't know, but apparently Peter Byrne, I believe it was Peter Byrne was his name, um, he considered the story to be quite true. He investigated it himself, and he felt it was quite true. There's other instances that I've ran across of native Indian people um, claiming that Sasquatch speaks their language. Apparently they used to, from what I understand, any of, from some articles I've read, um, and, and one, one Indian fellow that I was interviewing uh, one time, he told me the same thing. So I, there's probably some truth to it. Before, long before the white man came here to this, to this land, the Indians actually used to trade with the Sasquatch. The coast Indians, I should say, they would have an abundance of fish. They would catch the fish. They would dry the fish. In the mountains just up above the coast, there was deer and elk and stuff wandering around. They would take their extra fish, leave them in a pile up on the mountain somewhere, and they would go back the following day. The fish would be gone, and there would be a deer there or an elk. Uh, this kept a good relationship going between the native Indian and the Sasquatches. Uh, there's other stories in Native Indian history that point towards the fact that Sasquatch is, is uh, part of our human race. The, uh, the Harrison Lake Band at the north end of Harrison Lake, uh, from what I understand, there's some articles written that they, they, they believe that Sasquatch uh, is a relative to them. Now, I don't know... They had plenty of years to... Uh... Yeah, you know, I don't know how true these things are, but when it comes to these types of things, Native Indian people are known to be very truthful. One of the things that they do not have is the ability to carry their history in written books or in written form. Yeah. All of their history passed down through the hundreds and thousands of years is passed down verbally. 
whatever is passed down to the next generation has to be passed down verbatim. And it is supposed to be remembered and again passed on verbatim. They have no reason to lie about such things. They have no reason to make up stories about such things. And they would probably not because they are so very, very serious and dedicated about their history. And Sasquatch is part of their history. They lived with them for thousands of years before we came here. When Native Americans say that they can disappear and have supernatural powers and, you know, things like that, what do you say about that? I believe Sasquatch is flesh and blood. Um, I, I, I tend not to believe that kind of thing. I mean, uh, they, they do profess, so... That some of them do, yeah. Um, others don't, but probably uh, more so. Uh, if you were to take a consensus of all the North American uh, Native Indian people living on this continent, you'd probably find more than half of them believe that, but there are some who don't. Um, I, I, I just can't really absorb that. Uh, that's okay. going a little bit far-fetched for me. Yeah. Chuck, I mean, I, I was, I've often thought when, you know, I've heard those kind of stories before, they think they disappear and that kind of thing. Could it just be that, you know, it's it's you as a human being, well, us comparing, you know, we're not a very athletic animal compared to some of the other animals, obviously, out there in the woods. And, you know, if if you look at what these Sasquatch are capable of doing when you hear these stories of their running abilities and their leaping abilities and all the other things that you hear in stories, I mean, you're, you're comparing a very unathletic animal compared to another one. It's probably the best thing you've ever seen <laughs> running around. Well, you I know, I mean, it, 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 the stretch between the two, there's such a huge gap between the two. I mean, it makes it look almost magical after a while because you can only relate really to yourself. I guess I'm just thinking maybe that's a possibility. I don't know. Well, unless but, they're saying they can just disappear right in front of you. But, I mean, I could see that, you know, if they're following one and all of a sudden it's not there anymore, it could have leaped away or could it it could have ran real fast and they just some of the stories i hear of them just leaping from like the side of a road as the car's coming down from people that have been riding in a car and i, I i've heard people quote that these things can these guys can can leap easily in one bound 20 20 plus feet and i'm thinking boy and they, you know and i've heard a couple of people say that you know they're in mid straight they're they're in running stride ready when they hit the ground you know <laughs> you know you and i take a leap even close to that we'd have to come down and catch our you know catch our bodies underneath our own weight coming down, but these things are, you know, just take off and keep going. You know, and it's like, you know, it's, but, you know, I, I look at it like this. I don't know about you, Mr. Seltzer, but it, sometimes I, I remember, and I please don't, I'm not comparing them to gorillas by any stretch, if, if mm -hmm. anybody thinks that, but I remember going to the Washington, D.C. zoo with my kids several years ago, and my wife and I were talking, and I remember two male gorillas, probably, they were probably a good 120, 130 feet apart in their enclosure, and I, they were opposite ends beating their chests, and it was no more than maybe a little more than a second. They were chest to chest. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, I, I've never seen anything on this planet move that quickly before. <laughs> I mean, both of them covered 60 feet so quickly. It was yep. unbelievable. And I'm thinking if, if a Bigfoot is capable of anything even close to that, uh, you know, this thing's gone before you even got a chance to turn your head. You know, so yep. I guess that's really? what I'm just trying to roll. You know, when you, when you stop and think about that for a moment, what you just said, that that draws a very clear picture on on what other witnesses. There are some witnesses who who witnesses who have claimed that they've seen Sasquatch actually run down a deer. I mean, I don't know if the stories are true or not, but they're on the internet. I had some witnesses that came here. They were from Central Canada, from Saskatchewan. They were out here visiting. They went for a drive one evening um, just outside of Prince George here, going uh, towards the east. They were only a few minutes' drive from town, and a Sasquatch walked out of the, came out of the ditch, and in two big steps, he went across a two-lane highway. <laughs> and he, leapt off, le he, he leaped off, off the edge of the road on the opposite side, down into the ditch, and with one step he was across the ditch and part way up the bank, and he stopped there and looked at them as they drove by. The sun was to their back, so they got a perfectly good view of this. It crossed in front of their vehicle. The guy said no more than maybe 50 or 60 yards by the time it was off the road and they went by. They first seen it from a distance of about 200 or so yards away, and they're driving at the speed limit or close to it. You know, the speed limit out there is 100 kilometers an hour. I mean... 
they got a really good look at it. This thing had to be moving. The lady that uh, she got the best look at it because she was sitting in the driver in the passenger seat. They got a hold of me, by the way, and told me the story, gave me the GPS readings of where this took place. I went out to investigate, and I found I substantiated the story. The footprints were there. Everything was there. Now, the, the, the lady said that this thing was probably about nine feet tall, eight to nine feet tall. And when it came out of the ditch on, on, on the north side of the highway, it came up out of the ditch, and it was moving already. It hit the pavement. One step was towards the center line. The other step was to landed on the other side of the road, and he just took a leap over the bank. Now, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you, you've got a, a, a being or an animal, whatever you want to call it, eight to nine feet tall. They live in the bush. They hunt with their hands. They're taking down deer or whatever. You know, they're not just hunting rabbits, eh? These things have got to be able to move. And if you get a, a, a person or, or a creature or an animal or a being that's going to weigh somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, maybe 400 pounds or 500 pounds or maybe 600 pounds, there's got to be a lot of power in those legs, and those aren't short legs either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when those muscles start working, they're going to cover a lot of ground in between steps, especially you get that creature moving at full speed, there's going to be a lot of room in between those steps. Awesome. So to 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 say that uh, you know they could easily take a leap quite a long distance and you'd lose their tracks, uh, that's definitely a very good analogy. That's very true. Hey Chuck, I do have two uh, other questions for Mr. Seltzer. You still there? Can you hear me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, I just wanted TCO TC Ohio Bigfoot uh, had a question earlier. He wanted to know: Have you uh, left any gifts or anything, and have they traded anything uh, with you? Have you done anything like that in the past? I haven't deliberately done it. <laughs> 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 I, I did accidentally. Um, a few number of years ago, uh, back in around the real early 1980s, I was out hunting. And uh, I'd driven up on top of this mountain. It was a big clearing there that was kind of getting overgrown. Pulled off the side of the road, and I got out, and I had a big apple in my hand. And I was going to eat this apple while I just kind of had a look around, wait for the fog to lift. I saw some deer on the road up ahead, and these, these deer took off running. And I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a nice buck in there. I'm going to grab my rifle and go after him. So I took my rifle, and I, I locked up the truck. The apple was falling out of my mouth, so I took it out of my mouth and I set it on the hood of the truck. Grabbed my, loaded my rifle, locked the door, and I took off after these deer and forgot my apple on the hood of the truck. Well, I was gone for an hour or more, hour and a half, something like that. I came back. The apple was gone, which I figured it probably would be. You know, a crow or a raven would come down, pick it up, or you know, maybe a deer come along and reached up and grabbed a hold of it. The apple, but where the apple had been. There was a stick about an inch and a half in diameter and maybe about a foot and a half long. The bark had all been rubbed off of the stick, and it was like it was hand-polished. And there was a big rock there that looked like the rock had been hand-polished, and it had some nice colors in the rock. It was actually kind of, kind of an attractive uh, stone. The stone was about the size of a small grapefruit. Now, how in the world did those objects get on the hood of my truck where the apple had been? Oh, wow. So they were there. Yeah. They were left there. That, that That's great. Yeah. I mean, that's not – you know, a crow or a raven will take things and leave something in exchange. They have been known to do that the odd time. But there's no crow or raven that's going to pack around a rock that size but usually, and polish yeah. a rock yeah. and polish a stick and leave it as a gift. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I looked around. I, 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 I couldn't see any tracks or footprints or anything but I did see where large plate spots where the grass had been pressed down, and these large spots were like about four feet apart. Uh, I got a pretty good idea who had left the stone and the, and the, and the stick there. Yeah. Uh, around about that time, too, I can't remember if it was a year or two before, a year or two after. It was around about that same time period. I was hunting in uh, a different area. I had a feeling that I was being watched and being followed. Uh, so I got in my truck and I drove down the road a little bit further. And I stopped 
uh, got out, and I'm chewing on a sandwich, and I, I thought I saw something move at the edge of the bush uh, a bit down the road. As you go down the road about 100 yards or so, it kind of opened up into a bit of a clearing. And that's where I thought I saw something at the very edge of the road, just kind of a flash going into the bush. So I left my sandwich on, on, the, on the truck again, grabbed my rifle, and I beat feet down there to, to see what was down there because I had been seeing fresh moose tracks around. I got down there, I looked around, wandered around the clearing for a while. Uh, I don't know, I was gone for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes or something. Cut down around through the bush, circled around through the bush, and came back to where my truck was. Well, my half a sandwich was gone. But where the sandwich had been was a huge cone from a fir tree huh. and a pretty little purple rock. Hmm. So, yeah, I have traded unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was wondering, Leo, do you think that uh, certain people are just lucky? Uh, they, they are almost picked to be around Bigfoot, to see them, to have more than one sighting. It, it just seems like the people that do get, that do get that wonderful chance to see one uh always get a second chance and a third chance and everybody else is just always looking does that mean i got a chance chuck for a second (laughs) i think think there's a little bit to that uh one of the things of course is wherever you happen to live or where you do your recreation out in the forest and stuff like that uh but i think there is something to it as well you know there are people who could uh who could walk down a bush trail and there could be rabbits and deer and foxes all over the place and they never see a living thing. Uh, Tunnel vision, just don't see what's around them. Other people are very attentive. Uh, They could be walking down a mountain trail somewhere and there could be a little bird sitting in a tree 50 yards away and they'll spot that little bird. Uh, People are just like that. Some people see, some people don't see. I think it's also got something to do uh, I guess you'd call it intuition or a sixth sense. That's S-I-X-T-H, sixth sense. Uh, some people seem to be a lot more sensitive that way than others. Uh, you'll pick up on the fact that, or you pick up on the feeling, I should say, that you're being watched or there's somebody or something around. Other people can be with you and they don't feel a thing. All they're thinking about is, gee, i got to get back to the truck and have a coffee or whatever. So there are people who are a lot more uh, sensitive, a lot more apt to see things like that and pick up on on things around them than other people are. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Hey, hey, Chuck. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I wanted to get one more question in. Uh, Scott Carpenter's on the Skype right now. I wanted to get one more one more question oh, okay. from Wendigo from the chat room. Uh, Wendigo wanted to know if uh, let me pull it down here. <clears throat> what does Leo think about Bigfoot Sasquatch reports? Oh, it keeps scrolling on me <laughs> from other parts of North America, namely Ohio's Grassman's and Grassman and Florida Skunk Egg. Well, I, guess, I, I don't know if he's the, asking about differences between them or that kind of thing. Or well, well, these creatures or beings, whatever you call them, certainly aren't localized to one specific place. They're all over North America. They've been seen up in Alaska the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Hudson's Bay Area, all the way across the east coast of Canada, all over the United States, coast to coast, top to bottom, into northern New Mexico. You'll find also that in different areas, they're called different things. They go by a different name. Uh, skunk ape, uh, over, in, over in Europe, they're referred to as a yeti. Uh, whether they're the same creature or not, well, we don't know for sure because we don't have the specimens to compare. Yeah. yeah. Personally, myself, myself, I think that they are the same creature or incredibly closely related. I I seem to, personally, I I draw the analogy that, you know, we've got different people living on this earth. We have the white Caucasians. We have the Orientals. We have the dark-skinned people. Uh, we have the the red skinned people from India and that part of the world. You know the black people from Africa, South America. We, you know, there's different colors and different shapes of people all over this world. Sure. And they're easily picked out by looking at them, particularly at the faces. I don't see any reason why Sasquatch shouldn't be 
somewhat the same. I don't think that they are all cut out of the same cookie cutter where you could line up a hundred of them from different parts of, of North America and not be able to tell one from the other. I think that they all have individual faces, individual features. Um, that think, may vary a bit from terra, from area to area as well, too. I don't know. Yeah, he, he specifically typed into the chat room. He said, what do you, what, what you think about them being legit in those states? I guess maybe whether they're actually true sightings or, you know. Oh, I, I can I guarantee you my sighting some... was in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee you. Well, Sorry about that. My, yeah, I, there, I, there is an Ohio grass man. I know of at least one running around that I saw. <laughs> I can well, guarantee you there's one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no doubt that some of the sightings are, are not legit, but I, I think most of them probably are. People aren't going to come up and, 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 and pass off a story like that and risk being ridiculed unless there's something to it. You know, I mean, you're going to get the quacks who will, but basically yeah. human nature is that we don't want to – put out something like that unless we we are convinced of what we saw. Yeah, they're all over North America. They're all over uh, part, different parts of the world as well. No yeah, don't, like yeah. I was going to say, Chuck, that doesn't give you a license to call me a quack now just because I saw one. <laughs> <laughs> I've been okay, calling worse, and that's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I'm going to bring Scott, cause Scott Carpenter. He's a uh, regular on a lot of the talk shows here. He's right. on Skype here. I'm on board. Scott, 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 can you hear me, bud? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. I'm clear. Good. Hey, Chuck, how you doing? Very good, Scott. How are you tonight? Doing great. Leo, it's good to hear you. I hadn't, this is the first time I've got to hear you interviewed. And man, you're, you're, just, you're just wonderful. I, pre- I appreciate right, you coming thank on you. the Chuck thank Show. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I've been on I've been on the air a few times with different radio programs, and I I always appreciate the opportunity. It's not I'm not one person who who likes to 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 I I don't relish in any fame or anything. My the reason why I do these radio shows is so I can get the message out there. Sasquatch is real. People need to be comfortable with the fact that they are around. Don't hurt them. Let's live with them. Let's learn about them. Exactly, exactly. I had a couple questions. Uh, my background is I've been doing this for about two years. I've got, like you say, they chose me. I didn't choose them, so to speak. And there's a couple groups that I've been, I guess, researching. I go out in the woods and they do stuff to me and I try to capture them on film and all that good stuff. It's kind of like they play, you know, it's they're playing with me, I think, as much as I'm researching them. Mm-hmm. But uh, if if you were going to, purposely attract attract them what i mean what would you what would you use what what in your experience would bring them to you so that's what i'm having trouble with is getting them to come to me in one place you know like to get them on a trail cam or to even see them i mean i can walk to the woods and they'll find me but i'm saying if i wanted to attract them to try to capture them on a trail cam video what would you suggest well well first of all you got to learn about them and, and and try to put yourself in their shoes um, if you were a Sasquatch, how would you react and respond if people were around? Uh, the other thing is you don't go out and look for and find Sasquatch. You don't go to find – you don't deliberately go out in the bush and say, I'm going to go out and find Sasquatch. It doesn't work that way. They find you. Yeah. You don't find them. They find you. And you will know they're around when they want you to know that they're around. One of the things that you there are there are chances. There are chances. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, there are chance sightings. Absolutely, there is. Yeah. But one of the things you got to do is get yourself well prepared on how you're going to deal with the situation. Bring along some something that you can use for offering: uh, potatoes, carrots. Uh, I've heard that they like garlic. Uh, you know, something that, that uh, you can give as a friendship offering. Uh, learn some of the sounds that they make. There's there's some fantastic recordings uh, on the Internet that are free to listen to. The High Sierra recordings uh, have got some wonderful uh, sounds on there, vocalizations and stuff. I may not totally agree with everything that's on those recordings, but I I definitely recommend anybody who's involved with Sasquatch research get a hold of those High Sierra recordings. They're available on BFRO website, uh, Bigfoot Encounters, and Oregon Bigfoot. I believe that's for sale. They're for sale through there as well. Uh, 
also get yourself prepared with equipment. Digital cam, digital camera, uh, mm-hmm. good quality lenses. Uh, you know, if you go on my website, you'll see a list of equipment. It's, we're a little short on time for me to go into the whole list. But, uh, you know, learn the equipment that you need. Night vision is a good thing. Uh, a good pocket-sized digital recorder. If you can afford to do it, get yourself a parabolic dish microphone and uh, plug your little digital recorder into that and use that as well. There's some, there's some pretty good units out there in the marketplace. But uh, the, the, if you, when you go out there, find a place where you can set up camp where it's going to be fairly quiet and peaceful. Uh, do your calls. Learn how to do these calls and these sound effects and wait. Uh, if you think that they might be around, one of the things that works good is taking a big club and bang on a tree or a dry log, something that's really going to resonate and carry a long ways. Uh, do two or three whacks at a time and then leave it alone for a while. Then go do another couple of two or three whacks again. Uh, also, if you think that they're really close by, clacking rocks. Uh, pick up a couple of rocks the size of an apple or, or an orange and bang these rocks together. Uh, have some sort of a sequence to it, two or three clicks. Uh, if you hear rock clicking out in the bush and it's in the middle of the night and there's nobody else around there, you know who's clicking those rocks. Mm-hmm. They use that for communication amongst themselves. They also use the banging on a log or a tree with a big club to communicate amongst themselves. They have a couple of different calls that they use for communicating amongst themselves. One of the things that I picked up on a couple a few years ago was a, a, an owl hooting. Mm-hmm. I could hear this owl hooting, and it, for some reason it caught my attention because it, there was something about it. I couldn't put my finger on it. I recorded this, the owl, uh, and I got home and I listened to that recording over and over and over again. I finally picked up on it. When an owl hoots, when he does a hooting and is calling, they have a little bit of a, of a rattle in their throat, and you can hear that little bit of a rattle if you're paying attention. I've listened to Sasquatch recordings, or supposed Sasquatch recordings on the Internet, that sounded like an owl, but they didn't have that little rattle, that little resonating, resonating rattle. Mm-hmm. That is one thing you can listen for too. Uh, there's so much on the internet that you can learn from. There's stuff on my website that you can learn from. Uh, bas- basically, learn as much as you can. Go out there in the bush with the intent of attracting attention. But if you're going to go hunt one down, you won't find it. They find you. Gotcha. Uh, can I do a real quick follow-up, Chuck? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you about infrasound. Uh, I've I, I believe I've experienced it two or three times uh, when I've gotten too uncomfortably close to them. Have you ever experienced that? And when I take me in for sound, is I you get the feeling of dread. My eyes actually watered. I had trouble breathing. My heart rate went up, and you know that feeling of impending doom. You know, I haven't I'm, really experienced that the way you're describing it, but I have experienced something very similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my research partner and very close friend of mine, uh, we, were, we were out in the bush one day and it was a clearing, I th- uh, and we had uh, something around. I thought it was a moose or something. I went after it. I found out after a short while that even though I was trying to hunt it down to see what it was, it was actually following me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I turned around. I got very uncomfortable. I turned around went back to camp, or where we had left the truck, I should say, Mike and I were halfway through eating our lunch, and there was the most powerful feeling I have never in all my life felt anything like it. It was the feeling that we are not welcome. Go away. This feeling was powerful enough. We could not finish our meal. We we put our sandwiches on the bag. We closed up our thermoses. We drove down the road a couple of kilometers and stopped there to finish our lunch. That feeling was so strong, we simply could not get by it. We had to leave. I've heard that kind of thing happening to people, uh, numerous t- numerous stories about that on the Internet as well. I've also spoken with a couple of other people who have had exactly the same thing happen to them. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that before, too. Yeah. Hey, Chuck, uh, Chuck gotta, I was going to tell you, uh, we're uh, down we to one minute, buddy. To go, but we wanted to <laughs> give uh, Leo a chance to uh, tell us about sure. his book. Uh, where where we can get it. Great show, well, it's guys. available on my website. Uh, it's uh, www.sasquatc 
ch-pg.net. If you go on the Internet, type in your search engine. You go to Google or Bing and type in Sasquatch. Um, my website should come up on the first page or second page of your search. Uh, the book is for sale on there. Um, there's also some other stuff there that uh, that you might find interesting as well. Yeah, go to his site. He's got a lot of interesting stories there and sightings. It's a, it's a great site, and it does come up first on Google. So <laughs> you won't have any trouble finding it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming with tonight, Leo. We really appreciate it, and you're a wonderful That was great. Guy. Those are great stories. Yeah, those are great. We'll have to have well, you back. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I, I appreciate more. the opportunity a great deal. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Um, maybe one of these days you'll be able to get, in, get a program in where you can discuss um, ESP and that kind of or, uh, that kind of thing with Sasquatch as well. There's a lot uh, coming to surface now about that kind of a thing. Well, well, wait a second. I'm, I'm still getting over the eight-foot white thing I saw two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't throw ESP at me, man. <laughs> and uh, non-vocal communication, that kind of a thing. Yeah, there you go. Communication. I mean, there's a lot of stuff starting to come out now about Sasquatch having some very incredible powers. Well, Leo, okay, we're down we'll to three seconds. Back. You got to stop walking on me, Stacy. Uh, I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hey, listen, uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight, and we hope you can come back next week uh, uh, for the Man Tracker Show. Thank you all. It's our first show. We hope you can come back next week. Stacy, thank you as always. Yeah. You're great. And thank, <laughs> thank you, Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Okay. Nice, nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.